Like, who doesn't want affordable housing? I got death threats. I was standing in the street, and one of the neighbors drove up in his truck real fast. Er, screeches his brakes like two feet from me, almost, you know, pretending like he's going to hit me, yells at me, drives off. Yeah, so no, it's not for the faint of heart. Money runs out, and it was Christmas time. I just turned 40, and we ran out of money, so I was dead broke at 40. That was probably one of the hardest weeks of my life. I was like, I need to learn this in order to talk to contractors. That took five months, and I remember holding this check. So to go from broke to $57,000 in five months, and I was just like, I, just, I was just like, wow, I just, you start thinking differently. You know how everyone says you do the one thing? Yeah. I, I have not been good at doing the one thing. <laughs> this is the Better Life Podcast with Brandon Turner. And Cam Cathcart. Cam Cathcart. What's up, dude? <laughs> not much, man. How you doing? Good, man. Thanks for coming over last night and hanging out around the uh, pool. That dude, fun. It, it's beautiful. You have such a great house. Thanks, Great man. hosting house. Beautiful sunset. Thanks. You brought your kids over. I was very excited because my kids were kind of like like wanting to play. Yeah. I was trying to like entertain. And then you brought your kids. I was like, yes. <laughs> yes. Cam's got his kids over. So Dude, they all went and entertained themselves. Your great. chickens have gotten huge. They're, yeah, that sounds like a euphemism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know my chickens have gotten here. Yeah, they're 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 ready to go in their chicken coop. So yes. we gotta throw them in the chicken coop. You own chickens and I you own. got them as little yes. chicks. Yep. And, and now they've grown Yeah, a they lot. were like this big and now they're like chicken size. Is, for yeah. anybody that just listened yeah. to that. Yes. Yeah, that's not a euphemism for yes. anything. It's just <laughs> I actually have chickens that are growing. All right. Speaking of I have no idea transition there. Chickens. <laughs> Today's show is about somebody who is the opposite of being a chicken. David Bruce, who we often refer to in different ways you'll hear about throughout the show. And uh, he's a good friend of both Cam and I. He lives out here in Hawaii or on the Big Island. He's a real estate investor. He's got a great, great storytelling, a lot of great stories today. Uh, we just interviewed him. So now we're doing this intro here afterwards. But we just got done. We talked about, I mean, he was... He he lived a lot of lives, but he really at one point was dead broke. He said at forty. Yeah, he was dead broke. Had to yeah. borrow money for Christmas presents. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so like a lot of times, the people we talk to are like, "I got started at twenty, and I was a millionaire by 30. Like he he started later in life, mm-hmm. in a very expensive market. Uh, he's got a crazy dude, story about Amsterdam he, and death. Yes, and LSD. To think <laughs> like actually looking back at his story, I think it's amazing because he's basically broken all of the limiting beliefs that so many people have. Like Mm. I can't do it in an expensive market. I can't do it when I'm older. Um, I can't do it if I haven't like, don't have like the background in it. And he just broke belief after belief, after belief, after belief. And And he was dyslexic severely as a child. And he he tells that at the end of the, at the end of the story, but I'll say it here is he had to overcome a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those stories. If, if Bruce, Bruce can do it, you can do it. Yes. I'm excited for y'all to listen to that, uh, this episode. So without further ado, let's do it. Let's do it. This episode is brought to you by our friends at TurboTenant and Ballpoint Marketing. These two companies are big supporters of the show, and they know how to work with real estate investors and help real estate investors grow their businesses. So be sure to stay tuned to hear how you can get you know, discounts and free stuff from them both. And as you probably know, all the profits from this show go to charities of the guest choosing. So when you listen to the sponsors on the show and you work with these hand-chosen-by-me sponsors, you're actually doing good for the world. Now let's get to the show. David Bruce. What's up, man? Welcome to the show. What's up? What Thanks up? for having me, guys. Dude. So we're going to call you Bruce today. Yes. Because that's what I've always called you. You know, and it's it, weird to say David Bruce. It's definitely a little identity crisis. But, yeah. Uh, but Some you do know you we, David. Some you know my middle Bruce. name, right? Brandon. David George. Know. Turner. Is it really? David, David Turner, Turner Bruce. Bruce. No way. Yeah. I've got oh. you in my phone is Bruce Bruce. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Bruce uh, Bruce. Bruce. Yes. <laughs> so I knew your last name was Bruce. And then I heard everybody calling you Bruce, and I just assumed. Assumed your parents named you Bruce, yeah, Bruce. Bruce. You know, it, it was funny. something that I reverted to, actually, when I got into real estate. Yeah. Because I, growing up, everyone called me Bruce, and that's what I was known as. And then I was like, that's my name. Yeah, I like it, man. A little confusing, but. Bruce. Well, let's get into your story, Bruce. Yes. Uh, I know you as a real estate investor. You live over on the Big Island. I know you were a part of the Maui Masterclass. We've hung out many times. I know you come over here to Maui once in a while, and chill by my pool and we have great conversations. And so I know you got a cool story. Uh, I know you raise money, you buy real estate, you yeah. do a bunch of different stuff in real estate. I wanted to cover a lot of that. Uh, flip houses, wholesale, multiple states, all that good things. You're a Better Life Tribe member, of course. You look just like Jason Momoa, mm-hmm. pretty darn close anyway. And uh, yeah, you're a good dude, like a genuinely good dude. But before all that, <laughs> who was Bruce Bruce? Who was <laughs> David <laughs> Bruce, Bruce. <laughs> Bruce. <laughs> was David Turner Bruce? Um, certainly not who I was. 
Um, but I, I mean, I have a, I have a lot of lives um, lived, and it's I'm grateful. It's a good journey. Um, I was born in Boston, large family, five boys, one one sister. Did and you ever have the Boston accent? Oh, I used to. I got a video of me like really, yeah. You packed my, the car. Oh, I totally packed the car. I was like, break dancing, yeah. playing uh, <laughs> basketball and football like all day long. Oh, all right, okay. <laughs> um, I had an awesome childhood. A lot of fighting. Um, like I said, sports, basketball. So that was like my life was basketball, and I, I learned a lot through that sport, you mm-hmm. know. And I learned how to become a professional loser because. <laughs> <laughs> My older brother, <clears throat> two years older, and he kicked my butt like every day for 15 years. And every day I would come back and I'd be like, I would just take more. And I, I planted the seed. I don't know when, but I was like, I'm going to beat, I'm going to beat him someday. And that was a really good day. 20 years old. It took me that long. 20, 20 and I beat him seven times in a row. And I was, I was expecting like some dejected, you know, brother. Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah, it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> now, um. So from there, that uh, I was able to get a, a basketball scholarship uh, in San Diego, went to Point Loma Nazarene University, um, and that's where my journey began in real estate. Which my story is really a cautionary tale of how not to get started in real estate. <laughs> okay. So I uh, read Rich Dad Poor Dad in '99 with my college roommate. We shared a bunk. Doug, amazing dude. We're still partners to this day, and the light bulb went on for the both of us. Um, it went on more so for him. So we'll call Doug the rich kid and I was the poor kid. Okay. Um, I wasn't ready to grow up, graduated, and I moved to Europe. So I lived in Europe for a year. Where'd you go there? Uh, I was, so I was working for the Armed Forces Recreation Center. Um, it's a program there where they fly you out, they put you up. You, you're kind of military privileges and you're basically, I was living in the Alps. Snowboarded mm-hmm. like 67 days that winter. It was awesome. Oh. Um. Did my dash, you know, weekends I would travel. Then I did a three-month tour of Europe. And at the end of that tour, um, had a significant event, which we talked about. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'll probably tell you the story. But so I, ha- I was just, I had this relationship and I, I was like, this is not going to work. And so I was not in a great space. And two of my buddies that I worked with were like, hey, let's go to Amsterdam. Mm, which Why is always the sort of start of a really good or really bad story. <laughs> or so it <laughs> wasn't. I was like, yeah, you know, last hurrah. And they were going there for a specific reason, which we all know. It's, at that time, I, I believe it was the only place in the world it was legal, mm-hmm. marijuana, or drugs in general. So um, hop in the car. We're driving in the Black Forest. I'm driving. Car comes to a screeching halt. Er, look up. There's smoke. And there's a T-bone car. Run up there. Some guy's screaming. Some guy's out, like passed out. Blood everywhere. Everyone's, you know, screaming in German, and then we pull the door off, pull the guy out, ambulance show up, doing CPR, five minutes, ten minutes, and the guy died. Mm. So I was, like, tripping out, and I, I, I was not planning to partake in Amsterdam. Yeah. I just got into a space, and uh, so we're driving there, and they're like, Bruce, you're not, you're, you're not breaking any laws. Like, you know, let's go. So... We walk into this coffee shop, which is what they call them. I don't know why. Just a gigantic row of weed and whatever. We had no idea. We're like, well, we'll take four of those. So we smoke them. And um, I, I had tried weed. And I don't have to edit this or not show my kids. No, I, this is actually <laughs> a good, good conversation to have because it's everywhere. Yeah. So I was like, immediately, I was like, this is not normal. And so... I started tripping out and I was like, I started panicking and I went into, I started traveling inside of my body. It was the weirdest thing. I was like looking at my organs and I literally thought I was in hell. I was like, oh, I'm going to be the, the dude, the LSD dude that got stuck. Mm. Um, and so I, the next day I was like, that was not normal. I go back there. So and, you try it again just to make sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, dude, I, I was like, this was, this was horrible. I, I literally had this like dark presence come over me. We we're pink Floyd's on the wall. It was just not good. So I, um, I go back there the next day and I was like, Hey, what was, what was in that? And they're like, Oh, that's whatever cannabis laced with LSD. Oh, geez. 
And I was like, okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, that was bad. So we're, we get in the car, we drive home, Black Forest, er, come to a screeching halt, the exact same thing. No. This time it was three cars. We were a little bit later to the accident. We walk up there and there's already three dead bodies. Jeez. Um, as we walk up on this overpass, a gigantic gust of wind comes and blows the tarps off mm. these three bodies. I was like, what is going on? I, I was. Yeah, that doesn't happen to people, like w most people once in their lifetime. Never happened to me. In a weekend. Yeah, in a weekend. Two different times. Twice. I've never seen a dead body. I don't outside think I have a either. funeral. Yeah, I don't think I have outside of a funeral. It's jarring. Yeah. So for me, I was like, I immediately went to a, a place of like, okay, God, what? This is not normal. What are you? Yeah. What are you telling me? Um, and I just felt like he was like, you need to get your life together. Like mm. you've been living in Europe, and like I have a call on your life, and I have a plan, and it's not this, you know. So um, I had heard about this youth with a mission, and I grew up in a, a faith family, um, seen a lot of miracles. Mm. My parents were. Um, in ministry, also working. And um, so at 17, my mom said, David, you're going on this mission trip. And I was like, no, I'm not. And she's like, yes, you are. Kicked me out, and I went to Mexico, and it changed my life. Yeah. Like when you, when you walk and serve yeah. the destitute and the poor, it's like it, something switched to me. So that seed my mom planted came to fruition, and I decided to do a TTS with YOM. What's Kona. TTS? Discipleship Training School. Okay. And, and this was after your year in Europe? Yes. Or, uh, okay, after yeah. everything happened. I made a decision in Europe so kind of after there, this incident. Yeah. I was like, dude, I got to get my life together. Traumatic. One of the things that I think is so interesting um, it is talk to real estate investors all the time or just people that have like changed their life traumatic or dramatically, and it always seems to come after a traumatic event. Mm. Um, or some like pain point in their life. And um, I don't know. I think that's interesting. You know, that's on, that's been a theme in my life. Yeah. Well, uh, it's, which is not <clears throat> good. It's like, you should be ahead of those things. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, who is it? C.S. Lewis. He has this quote. Oh, he says that God whispers to us in our pleasures, but shouts to us in our pain or something mm, along yeah. those lines where it's like, yeah, it, th those pain, those those traumatic events, like those are a time, like Lisa, for all of us, we we come from a Christian background where like God's trying to get a hold of us for some some reason, yeah. for some purpose. Clearly, he was speaking through these yeah. events. So I I did the DTS, and I did an outreach to the Philippines. Again, that changed my life. Man, I I learned what true joy was going to the Philippines. We served in this region called Tarlac. And the average salary for everyone was $200 a year. Like their walls were sheets. We helped build the church. And like God really got a hold of me. And um, I was like, oh, this, this is my life, you know. And at that time, I, had, I met Natalie. Mm -hmm. and Your wife? Yes. Um, Where'd you meet her? In, she mm -hmm. was doing a school of worship. Um, and I was doing the DTS. And um, so... Both connected with YWAM? Yeah. Was it school? Okay. Same time. And we met, fell in love, ended up getting married about a year later. <coughs> Excuse me. And we both felt like this call. So we decided to join Youth with a Mission. And um, from there, we were both passionate about music, which is kind of funny. She, she could sing. And I had just started to learn the guitar. And we went and, we went and prayed, kind of fasted separately. And we were like, we don't know what we're going to do with our life. Would God speak to you? Would God speak to you? And I was like, this is really weird. But I feel like the Lord said we're supposed to start a band, like a, like a rock and roll band. She's like, huh, that's what he told me. <laughs> so we jumped in doing that, and we were in music for over a decade, touring all over the world. Um, we recorded three albums. Tour, our, our main markets were Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. Um, Why do you think, like, 
if somebody who, especially if they're listening to this and they're not a Christian in any way and they don't, yeah. you know, believe any of this, they're well, they're probably wondering, like, well, why would God want you to form a? I mean, maybe anybody's wondering that. Why would God want you to form a band? Like that just sounds, you know, like self self serving or like, oh yeah, it's just what you'd like to do. Why would God? How does that help the kingdom to have a yeah. band? Like, it's a great question. And my answer is, um, music is the most powerful form of communication. You know, it mm-hmm. speaks to your mind, body, and spirit. Mm-hmm. And if I need to get to a place, the fastest it's through music. If I'm working out, I'm listening to something like Metallica. Yeah. If I need to get you know centered with God, I, I put on some worship. Um, and and that was our goal was to communicate. It wasn't like, hey, we want to be rock stars. So we would we would play in churches, we would play in music festivals, we played in death metal bars. We saw some <laughs> crazy stuff. <laughs> like saw a lot of miracles. Um so I guess that's my answer is is and it, it's it's such a huge part of my life. I love music, um, which we got to partake. Yeah. We Best like, concert of your life. That's not the part. We did not partake in, <laughs> in Amsterdam. We went to yeah, U2 we just, together. Just make it clear. I, I twisted. I, I forced Brandon. You played the ukulele last night for my daughter. To, uh, <laughs> to go see U2 at the Sphere. And that was. That was a great night. I was. Epic. I'm not even a U2 fan, but that was a great night. Did you become one? Yeah, no. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> They're not as good as New Found Glory. They're just not as good as New Found okay. Glory. Which leads That's me the to. the best band of all time. Brandon Turner. <laughs> Bruce it, thinks it's weird that I think that that I know. Sorry, not think that I know. Newfound Glory is the best band of all time, and uh, you apparently think it's you too. There is if a you single could, person if you on the listen, planet. There's one right here. If you could only listen to one song for the rest of your life, what would it be? Uh, my friends over you, Newfound Glory. What about you? Or a good Mayday Parade. Oh, okay. you know, like Katie. Yeah, don't yeah exactly. Cry. Uh, yeah, no. So good. I can't answer that. There's too many. You have to. <laughs> okay. 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 Where the streets have no name because it's talking about heaven. Okay, that's a good okay. song. That was a good song. Um, Mine's here in your arms. Hello, goodbye. Oh, hello, goodbye. Yeah, yeah. I like. Yeah, where we are, we are. Yeah, <laughs> but that's a good. Song. To that point, this is something that I've learned from you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> your I think I said it to you. Your delusion is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's unwavering conviction. Yes, unwavering. that's what it is. I, like, I see this delusion <laughs> because clearly they are not the best band of all time. No, of all time, Newfound Glory is okay. the best band of all time. Yes. But that conviction, <laughs> unwavering, unwavering has got you through some major milestones. Mm. And I've learned a lot in that regard. It's like, I need some of that delusion. Uh, unwavering, delusion. unwavering conviction. <laughs> I mean, it aren't like most like incredible entrepreneurs and people, they're, they're delusional. Yeah. Like, oh. There's a legitimately like they have it is true. visions of grand, grand, grandeur, grand, grand, yeah. grand. And I think there's, there's probably a fine line. This, this, that sounds weird. There's probably a fine line between that delusion and that vision and narcissism. And, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll flirt with that line maybe and saying things yeah. like, like, and yes, it's meant to be funny. Like, you know, New no, Fun Glory is the best honestly, band of all time, but I really believe they're the you best really band. really, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> like, Do you the, really, really believe that? Here's the thing. They are the best band of all time for me. I just don't need to say the word for me because it's like all that matters is me because I'm a narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, there we go. No, but it, there's a there's an unwavering belief and conviction in things like Opener Capital will be a fifty million dollar a year yeah. you know business. We like you know the Better Life Tribe is going to have ten thousand people. We're going to yeah. give away fifty million dollars a year to fight human trafficking. Yeah. Now that's not that's not true yet, but I'm unwavering in my conviction that that is going to be mm-hmm. a thing. No, have you had a time in your life where you were wrong? Like, uh, I mean, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure I have. But uh, I'm a narcissist, so I forget all those things. <laughs> yeah, well, I was thinking through like my life, and and I have that mm. as well, where it's like I want to do this, and then it happens, and I want to do something else, and, and I feel like I don't know, just because of my my unwavering belief in myself, yeah. it always happens. Yeah, um, and I think there's something there. Obviously, there's Hal like Elrod that. has a book called The Miracle Equation, mm-hmm. and there's something like I can't remember the equation, but it's basically an unwavering conviction. I think is one of his form, pieces of the formula uh-huh. there. And, and then just like relentless action or something like that will get you the results you want. Um, yeah, when we walked through that, uh, my vivid, what are, my yeah, vivid, vivid vision, vision. Yeah. That, that totally set me up for a mindset shift. Mm. And tapping into that is something that everybody should do because um, we all have a call in our lives. So like, why not? Yeah. Let's do mm-hmm. it. Yeah, I think that uh, indecision is one of the greatest thieves of, progress and joy 
right? Mm-hmm. It's just like, I don't know what to do. I'm not sure what the next thing is. I'm not sure what the right, where should I go to college? What career should I do? What kind of real estate should I buy? Mm-hmm. Just this indecision is just weakness and an inability to make it, a, you know, to, to stand for something and yes. say, no, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to be delusional about mobile home parks. They are the greatest investment on the planet. I, I say this often, it's like, like mobile home parks, I went all in on them. And yeah. the reason why I went all in on them had nothing to do with the data around mobile home parks. Sure, there's data that, su- that suggests yeah. that they can be a good investment, but it had nothing to do with that. I went all in because I, I chose it. Yeah. Um, just like when you get married, like, oh, I don't know if my spouse is the right one after a couple of years. You're like, oh, I don't really have the, the fire anymore. Yeah. No, you, you go all in because you choose. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, unwavering conviction. Anyway, back to you, man. Where were we at? We were at you. Uh, you YWAM were YWAM traveling YWAM around. Traveling yeah. Rock band for 10 years. <clears throat> so awesome time. Um, we actually had our son while we were still touring. So. Caden's been to like over 20 countries. That's cool. Where and did you guys I, have him at? Was he? He was born in Kona. He was born in Kona. And um, I actually c- counted the amount of flights that he had been on. <laughs> uh, well, I counted the legs because it sounds a little yeah. better. It was like 350 flights. <laughs> and he never cried on any flight except one. And it was from Kona to Honolulu. Oh. And it's because I picked him up and I hit his head on the, on the <laughs> overhead. <laughs> It's a on tall purpose, person problem. Was he, was he acting up? Well, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's choking. That's not true. He was, <laughs> if he wasn't wired that way, like super chill, he's chill to this day. Yeah. Um, we probably would have hung it up a lot earlier. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and, and where it came to an end, I remember it was our, our, la- uh, our third tour in Japan. And I was like, on the flight home, and I was like, we've arrived. Like, we made a bunch of money. We had like 23 shows in 30 days or whatever and i was like oh yeah we made it you know um and then that week i got we got pregnant i got pregnant. we got pregnant our drummer proposed to our nanny <laughs> and our keyboard player said i want to go to film school and i was like no mm-hmm. it's all falling apart so i uh i kind of went into this identity crisis when you do something for that long you know i just didn't know what to do and kind of depressed and um so the only thing i knew was i saw my buddy doug my rich kid roommate he was crushing it in real estate by that time he had probably flipped 200 homes in southern california wow so i did i was just like nat are you cool with this if we uh i don't know what to do um if we move to marietta california so i call up doug and i'm like hey doug um i know it's gonna sound weird but i'm gonna move my family to your town and I need you to show me everything you know about mm-hmm. your business. And you don't have to pay me anything. And he was like, he was kind of taken aback, like, dude, that's a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of didn't give him an option. Thank you, Doug. Yeah. Um, and I just started showing up at his office. And I, so I was working at a restaurant at night to pay our bills. And I started shadowing him. And that's how I learned real estate from A to Z, like all of the. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wholesaling, dispositions, acquisitions, project management. I used to door knock back in the foreclosure days. And I was nuts. We'd get a list of like 30 properties. And be like, and so I'd drive to them. And my whole goal was to get inside and have a conversation with this person that's mm-hmm. losing their house that day. And there were some fun stories with that, you know. Get the yeah. property. And <laughs> were you doing this for you or for Doug? Were you kind of doing, doing acquisitions for Doug? For him. Love that. Yeah. Um, because I I I still didn't have the the mindset right to yeah. get it i didn't feel like i had enough knowledge and i was still learning so um at the end of that my whole goal was to learn that and to bring it back to hawaii so at the end of that year moved back to hawaii you know thought i had all this knowledge where i could jump into it and so the way i, I stayed connected to doug i said listen hey is it cool if i um raise capital for you at the time it was three points and 12%. And uh, I said, how about two, two points, 12%? And he was, I kind of, I kind of thought, I think he thought I was like, nah, but yeah, go for it. You know, like good luck. So I had his super success and I just started marketing it to people and I started raising money for his company. And what does that mean? Like, how do you, how would you do that? Just conversations with friends and people, you know, in Hawaii? Yeah. Yeah. Just people I knew and, and, it was kind of easy because he had such a great track record. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, almost everyone I would talk to would be like, yeah, I got this. And then it became, can I give you more? Can I mm, give you more? Yeah. 
And I, I still have those same investors 14 years later. How do you approach a conversation like that with an investor? Like, hey, you know, like, hey, this potato salad's really good. You know how you can make more money? You know, like, how do you mm-hmm. bridge that gap from just like having a normal, friendly conversation? Or do you set up a business appointment with them? Like, walk us through a little bit of that, what it takes to pitch an investor to fund your deal or somebody else's deal. Well, first of all, it comes down to relationship. And, you know, people are, they're trusting in you. So it's it's just casual. I wasn't like salesy of like, it was just, I would present the opportunity and I had my little pitch deck. Mm-hmm. Hey, if you know, if you're interested, if you got some money sitting around, you know, I got this thing here. It was, I honestly don't know how I did it. <laughs> it's just, and then it organically w- would grow. So they would be like, tell their friend. Um, so I don't have, I, w- I don't know. I didn't, mm-hmm. I've never even had a business card. <laughs> yeah. It, it was just all relationships. And I think that's one thing that I been good at is just being with people and it's it's so much about trust like yeah. i take it extremely seriously when you're taking someone's money like if i if i ever lost money and i couldn't have a way to pay it i would sell my house to pay that person back yeah and i think people get that yeah and and so that's how i was able to grow it so um hey before you go into your the like how you got started i yeah. like i want to move there obviously but i want to make sure we get time to plug this week's uh show a uh, charity that we're going to be donating some money to. Mm. So on the show, we obviously give 100% of our ad revenue directly toward a charity of the guest choosing. So Bruce, Bruce, where are we sending the money today? Human kind girls. Human kind. Tell me about this. So this is uh, a nonprofit that my wife started. Um, really, she's been doing it for the last 10, 15 years. Like her heart is identity in young girls. Mm. And um, as a father of two teenage daughters, well, shoot, one's 12, um, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like raising daughters and the pressures that they have, just everyday life and social media. And so she developed a program where she's, she's teaching in schools. And then she, she wrote a book, kind of a, a program with Dr. Kim, who has a PhD in uh, identity. And so she goes into schools. She trains youth with admission outreaches. So it's kind of going out all over the world. And it's just speaking just truth in life over there. You know, so she goes through five words, um, beautiful masterpiece. Uh, dang it, I'm forgetting. <laughs> um, but no, that's, you know, she's doing great things and it's, it's really spreading. And I think that it's something that's needed. That's so important. You know, like, it's rough. Yeah, Yeah. what girls are going through these days, like, my heart just breaks for teenage girls. Like, the anxiety is just at, like, it's just, like, off the chart levels. Yeah. And, like, they have no, like, they so many girls are lost. I mean, boys too, but girls especially, they're just lost, and they're scared, and they're anxious, and they're miserable, and suicidal. And, like, it's just, it's it's terrible time to be a teenage girl. So It used to be just at school. Now it's Mm -hmm. everywhere. Yeah. Um, You know, so... Cool, man. Um, yeah. Well, we will. Human kind girls. Human kind girls. Well, we will send the money from this episode there. Much this appreciated. week's sponsor. All right. So I looked down at my phone and I see this text. You need to call me. Your house is on fire. <laughs> and I sat there and I'm looking at the screen and I'm wondering, is this some kind of a joke? The guy who sent it was a tenant I've been trying to evict for months and he hadn't paid him forever. He had trashed the house. I mean, it was disgusting. And the guy himself was, you know, pretty darn unstable. Now, of course, I call him after that text and it goes to voicemail. Great. Now, a few minutes later, I get a call from the fire department. Yep, my first ever rental house was burning down. So how did I get myself in that situation? Well, I didn't screen that tenant. I put in someone I thought would be good, and he was until he wasn't. Now, this is over a decade ago, and since then, I've learned how to properly vet a tenant, and that's through Turbo Tenant, which makes screening for both background and credit really, really easy. But it gets even better. TurboTenant also helps you market your rentals to like dozens of the largest sites, including apartments.com and Redfin. You can create custom leases that cover all your rental laws. And you can even use TurboTenant for your automatic rent payments. All of this for less than the cost of your Netflix subscription. Yeah, I know, crazy. Save time, save money, and save your sanity by using TurboTenant. And because you're so darn cute, you can use the code BRANDON10 to save 10%. So check it out at TurboTenant.com slash betterlife. 
Hey, so many of you have heard me tell that story about how I bought my daughter Rosie a fourplex, like a rental property, the week she was born, and how we put it on an 18-year, you know, mortgage payoff plan so it'll be paid off when she graduates from high school. So essentially, my tenants are paying for Rosie's entire college. Now that's pretty awesome, right? Not to mention it's also making almost like a thousand dollars a month in cash flow. That's double awesome. But I don't think I've ever shared really exactly how I found that deal. So here it goes. I found it through direct mail marketing. And here's how. I simply built a high quality lead list of a lot of names and addresses of potential sellers. And I sent out a whole bunch of mail to every person on that list. And then I talked on the phone to a ton of people. And then I finally got one person that was interested enough to sell me the property. And I got a deal at a great price. So building that giant lead engine like that, I mean, it works, but it takes a ton of time, knowledge, and effort, which can really slow down an investor's growth, which is why I reached out to my friend Ryan with Ballpoint Marketing. I asked him to sponsor this show because they're the best at doing everything that I just talked about. Like they're literally going to help you build your entire lead engine. You're gonna get a one-on-one -on -one call where they're gonna help you figure out what you want and then build your lead list for you. Their robots are going to handwrite the postcards with a real pen, which is super cool. They're gonna send them out and they'll even answer the phone calls for you. Plus, they'll help you track it all inside of a CRM that they create for you. I know, it's crazy, crazy awesome. And it's going to help you land way more deals consistently. And because you're awesome and because you listen to this show, you're going to get a discount when you tell them that I sent you or just use code Brandon when checking out with them. I love Ballpoint Marketing and officially recommend them to all my friends and masterminds. So if you're ready to kick your deal flow up a notch, getting more quality leads without pulling your hair out, just go to ballpointmarketing.com slash better life, or just shoot me a DM on Instagram with the word ballpoint, like one word ballpoint, and I'll hook you up with them directly. Well, let's move on. What came next, man? You're raising, raising capital for Doug, yeah. learning the business, you're in Hawaii. When so you get I come estate? back to Hawaii, I'm like, Guns blazing. I'm going to get into real estate. It's freaking hard to do mm -hmm. real estate in Hawaii. Um, and at the time, my good buddy is film director. He's like, hey, Bruce, um, you got some skill sets that I think, you know, I'm starting this film studio. Would you want to help me start it? So it was a public-private content accelerator. We were attracting films to Hawaii. And I was like, well, I haven't landed a deal yet. So, okay. <laughs> so uh, that turned into five years which was awesome, like, you know, kind of dabbling in the film industry. and Were you acting or directing or what were you doing? Uh, so I was the outreach coordinator of basically attracting films okay. to the studio. I have dabbled in some acting. Wow. Chase Momoa. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, <laughs> played a Philistine <clears throat> king once. Um, wow. No, but uh, yeah, I, I love anything creative, you know, music, acting, whatever. And, and so I was like, okay, this is... This is going to, this is going to get us through and, and I'll start real estate, you know, along that somewhere along the way that didn't happen <laughs> again, my ridiculously long journey. So the end of the five years, the public money ran out. So we had to close the studio, which is unfortunate because we brought two or three films raised millions of dollars in the community. And they, it was a very small, like, chunk of change, but it kept the doors open. Anyway. Didn't you have one script that you were really close to selling for, like, a crazy amount of money over in— Yeah, so uh, we, were, we were developing Day of War based on the life of David from the point of view of Benaya. And um, originally, we wanted to shoot on the Big Island. The budget was, like, $150 million. Then it, it was like, okay, that's too much. Then we shopped it to Mexico, and it kept going down, South Africa. And it ended up in Bulgaria, the same studios that did um, 300. Mm. So the budget was $22 million. Lionsgate said, yes, you know, we'll pick it up. And, but you need one of these, like, five A-list actors. And it just, it just never came to pass. It's, it's an amazing story. Like, he, he's my favorite character. Like, yeah. you know, not only is it mm -hmm. my name, but like I identify with David more than anybody in, mm -hmm. in the Bible. So do you remember one time we were having a conversation and this is before I knew any of this. And I told you, I was like, I've always had this crazy idea. I would love to write a script for a movie about David, but not from like the perspective of David. And I mean, we had this conversation this was a couple of years ago and you're like, Brandon, <laughs> we already have that. And it was like, <laughs> it, was, it was a crazy <laughs> coincidence. And then you told me all about that. And I was like, that's wild. Like, and that's that, still in the works. And that's, that's yeah. the film industry. Sometimes like yeah, uh, takes Princess forever. Bride took 
10 years wow, yeah. mm, to get it, get it through. So, um, yeah, film and money runs out and it was Christmas time. I just turned 40 and we ran out of money. And so I was dead broke at 40. And so I had to call my, my father-in-law and borrow $10,000 to pay rent and have a meager Christmas. And I was just, I, that, that was probably one of the hardest weeks of my life. Just like, I've never, I'm not a depressed person, but I was depressed that week and I was, I was lost. So I call up Doug. I'm like, dude, I'm, I don't know what to do. And he's like, Bruce, you know, this industry, you need to get out there. You need to jump out and do it. And he's like, I don't need your money. By that point I had raised $20 million for his, for his flips. And so I called all my investors and I was like, Hey, uh, I'm jumping out on my own to do real estate. If you want to invest with me, great. If you want to stay with Doug, that's cool too. Every single one of those investors jumped ship. And so now all of a sudden I had all these investors. So I slowly transitioned, you know, to my Hawaii business. So the first house that I did was in Hawaiian beaches, which is probably one of the rougher neighborhoods in all of Hawaii. And I bought this house for fifty three thousand. <laughs> fifty three thousand in Hawaii. In Hawaii. in Hawaii, lava zone two. And hey, can you explain lava zones for is those that who the same think that's flood zone? Well, well except for that, <laughs> you're not getting flooded not with water. water. It's lava. <laughs> There's really that. Oh yeah, I did not know. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. tell us about lava zones. Dodging volcanoes in real estate. Yeah. <laughs> so and, and and actually at my uh, at the time one of my good friends in the film studio he was the guy that had the most watched volcano thing at Mount St Helens. I forget the fire below us. Mm-hmm. And he goes, hey, hey, Bruce, come here. Let me show you something. And he pulls it up and he, he looks at this lava, like the flows. You can see the history. And he goes, you're buying a house in, in a lava zone, like, and there's an active volcano. Are you sure you want to do that? Two years prior to that, this volcano had been going for three years. And it was like a slow moving, just, mm-hmm. you'd hear it every day on the radio. And you just kind of tune it out. Yeah. And it, it, it stopped. But if that volcano had kept going, it would have wiped out the entire subdivision. <laughs> so here's this lava flow, and I bought the house right here. <laughs> that's fascinating. I did not know that there was a such thing as lava zones. Yeah, that's, yeah that's, there's that's, eight lava zones. One is like Leilani, like that's where the fissures are. And two is usually down rift. Uh, um, and then it goes up to eight. So eight's the safest? Yes. Okay, you so, were at two. <laughs> two. Uh, you can't build in one. In fact, a lot of insurance companies aren't doing Lava Zone Tune anymore. Mm. So um, I, and I didn't know anything about construction. And, and so my MO was like, I have to learn. So I was on it from beginning to finish. And fortunately, I had a guy that just was willing to teach me, mm-hmm. you know, because I, li- I literally knew nothing, you know. He'd say, oh, Gary, grab the hammer drill. And I'd be looking for a hammer or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I just, so I was like, I need to learn this in order to, to talk to contractors. And then, um, so was, that took five months. And I remember hold, holding this check for, I think I made $57,000. Wow. wow. So to go from broke to $57,000 in five months. And I was just like, I, just, I was just like, wow. I just, you start thinking differently. So. Yeah, because you get the confidence. You're like, oh, this worked. Yeah. Like, I worked. Like I did it. It was. Yeah. It was awesome. So I burned the ships. Yeah. Moved to the island of real estate, and I never went back. Dude. So I started flipping in in east side, west side, Big Island. Then um, jumped to Maui. Um, then jumped to Kauai. And, and somewhere in there, I am in the process of doing a development. And that was, originally it was a workforce development that, it's been a beast, man. Development in Hawaii is no joke. Mm-hmm. So... <clears throat> We can go into that or not. I mean, yeah, let's talk about it. Why? Why are you having so much trouble? Because this is not just Hawaii. For those listening, like a development in uh, a lot of areas that are anti-growth is just incredibly difficult um, across the country. So, what lessons have you learned? What went wrong? Uh, where are you at with it? Yeah. So, we bought this lot, and you know, growing up in a, or not growing up, being here for twenty four years and seeing a lot of your friends just come and go. Like I kind of, kind of got a heart for like. Hey, affordable housing. Like, there's so much that the state could be doing. So I came across this property, and I had done a flip up in Kula, 
And the guy that I was working with was was a friend, and he was the yeah, at that point he had built over a thousand affordable units in Maui. Mm. And he was like, "Hey, Bruce, this lot we we did two developments right across the street. Um, would you be interested in doing it uh, with us?" And and so I was like, "Yeah, let's do that." And so the whole way through, the county was like, "Yes, we need this. This is great." But the neighbors formed a coalition, the NIMBYs. Mm. Not in my backyards, and um, so yeah. I had to go. I had to Which go is to, so funny because so many people want affordable housing yeah. until it's just in their not, backyard. Yeah, not exactly. my backyard. Exactly. We need affordable housing, just not there because I don't yeah. want. That's exactly here. what they would say. Yep. And so the way they basically started the kerfuffle was, this is a wetland. This is the kidney of Kihei, mm-hmm. and so we had the Army Corps of Engineers report. It's not a wetland. It's two blocks in. There's com- development completely around this. This, <laughs> you know, you know. So I, I get it. They don't, you know, want it in their backyard. So anyway, um, they vetoed it five to four. Mm. And we knew that could happen. And so plan B was let's build on it as it's entitled. So that's what we're currently doing right now. So we we pivoted and we're in the civil stage. Of- so they won't let you build affordable housing, but they will let you build expensive housing. Yeah, three multi-million dollar houses or twelve or twelve. No, let's call them multi-million. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, no, at 12, I'm going to do 12 entry level homes. Okay. So entry, but I mean, still here, that's but not workforce. Yeah. And a million bucks. And the, cra- the crazy thing is we, we went over, we bent over backwards. Like you had to be a local. Um, and it, we were selling them 200,000 below market value. We had tax credits. We had a million dollar tax credit, which, which allows you to build, um, that affordable housing offsets the costs. And if you sold that, it was deep restricted. You'd had to go to another local resident. And um, post fires, we were hanging out with Jason um, Alpha, yeah. And he's like, "Hey, I, I think you should reconsider submitting that." And I was like, "No, yeah, I, I, I I, I've been I, down this road, and we already pivoted, which is unfortunate because I could have, we would have had twenty eight units, yeah, you know, on the market by now." Mm. Um. So, as far as what I'd learned, I think we could have done better in the PR phase, like thinking it was a slam dunk. Like, who doesn't want affordable housing? Um, people are, I got death threats. I was standing in the street, and one of the neighbors drove up in his truck real fast. Er, screeches his brakes like two feet from me, almost, you know, pretending like he's going to hit me, yells at me, drives off. I was there with some other guys. One of the guys hits the, hits the car. He's like, what the? Um, yeah, so no, it's not for the faint of heart. Especially in Hawaii. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Wild, man. It is. All right. Let's have some flipping stuff. So what have you, what has worked really well in terms of flipping houses in just an expensive market? Uh, yeah. What has worked really well? How are you finding deals? Where have you struggled? Let's talk about that for a little bit. What's worked well is, is just keeping options open. It's not like St. Louis where mm. you have a lot. So you have to be really opportunistic. You have to look at the the laws. So, like for example, right now I have a property in Kauai, and it's I bought it for a million, rehabs three hundred, and there's a thing called CPR, which is basically subdividing it. So I'm flipping it, and I'm subdividing it. That lot on its own market value is four hundred fifty thousand. Mm. So it's like looking at things a little bit differently. Um, you look at Oddball properties are actually good here because yeah. you kind of can get that multi-unit situation. Um, I, I built some spec homes as well. Like it's it's kind of like you know how everyone says you, you do the one thing. Yeah, I I have not been good at doing the one thing, <laughs> and I think in Hawaii you kind of have to to do that. You yeah. know, it's like oh, mm-hmm. it's, the shiny object actually helps you here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's like Cam, you're always like, I buy three, two, ranch yeah, style, you, like single single yeah. level. Like you have like that thing. If you did that in Hawaii, you'd be like, there's one property. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's well, yeah. and it's so hard here because my wife and I were looking for a house. And we're we're at one of the areas that we have identified is actually your neighborhood. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that's holding us back is we don't know what's a good deal and what's not because there's just no yeah. house that's the same. There, yep. there's no comps in there. Like there's houses that go yeah. all over the place, but yeah. it's like Every house is completely different, has a different lot, has yeah. different pools or, you know, uh, studios or Ohana's on it. And it, it is, it is 
I would say, which we don't invest here, but if, if you were like for you, it's not for the faint of heart because it's, uh, you're, you're risking everything. Like uh, when I buy a house, I know exactly what it's going to sell for within probably five or $10,000 every single time, because I've got 20 other houses within a quarter of a mile that are that exact same house that have sold. Yeah. My house is worth between four and five million. Yeah, exactly. That's the best that agents well, can say. It's yeah. like, that's crazy. One of the houses that we're looking at, we got that same exact where they were like, it's between two and a half and three and a half million yeah. dollars. I'm like, that's a huge spread. That's huge. Like, spread. What, what, like, where am I supposed to offer at? How am I supposed to do this? Because we're yeah. actually talking with them. It's direct to seller. And I'm like, I also don't want to, I don't want to, throw out a low ball offer and, and make them mad. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, how, how do you, how do you determine the value of a house here? And then also on top of that, getting creative, which I think that's something that I love about your story because you are, uh, you are like, just, I've gotten to hang out with you a ton. You're a creative person. Like you love music, you love art, you love film. And, um, seeing how you were able to take your skill set, like your superpower is that you're creative. And then, transferring that over into real estate um, hmm. is so cool because now you're looking at properties and like you called me about a house here where you're like, Hey, we can CPR this and we can sell this for X amount. And then we can do an Ohana here and we can sell this. And then we can, you know, take the house to um, two different units and rent it. And it, it's things that I would never think about because I'm just not that creative of, of a person. And you're being, you've been able to say, Hey, I'm a creative person. And this is what I did, you know, up until I was 40 years old. And now you've you're using that superpower to crush it in real estate, which I think is is incredibly uh, powerful and cool for people. Where it's like, hey, mm. whatever your skill set is, is you can use that to to crush it in real estate. Thank you, Bruce. How how do you find ARV like the after repair value of a property when you're flipping it when there aren't a lot of comps? Like, how have you navigated that? Just like. Doug taught me, he uses, you know, find your three closest comps in apples for apples. Don't fudge the size of the lot, the bedroom count, um, you know, but it is different because there is perceived value a lot of times because 70, 80% of properties here are not permitted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have to make the call, am I going to fix that, which I usually do, mm-hmm. um, and you, you're doing it unpermitted, so on the appraisal, It's not, you know, the, uh, I guess what the county record says. So like, for example, I did a, I did a flip in Kona and it on record, it was 964. Square feet. Yeah. Yeah. 964 square feet, but they had did a a bunch of stuff Mm -hmm. and it was actually 1500 square feet. And so I was like, well, let's just, you know, rehab that. And I was worried about the appraisal. And so um, we did that and. I got like 20 offers. You do your job right. You get a lot of action. And, and it could, because I, I listed it actually at 1500 because that's what the actual perceived mm-hmm. living yeah. was. And you just have to disclose it, like, you know, check yeah. the county records. And um, so I said, highest and best, we'll show preference to anybody that's willing to waive the appraisal. Mm-hmm. And so he got bid up like 30,000 over asking. Um, so yeah, that creativity, I think is, yeah. So here, do, do they have to appraise it based upon the county records? Like, did he have to appraise that the appraiser have to appraise that as a 964 square foot house? Technically. Yeah. Really? But because there's not so many, it, it, uh-huh. I've never gotten caught on appraisal. Uh-huh. And I think because you don't have three close by. Yeah. The appraisers here are like, well, it, the offer was that, so let's call it that. Yeah. yeah. You know. Which is probably the way that it should be. Yeah. That's cool. Have you ever lost money on a flip? I'm about to do my first. Really? Tell me about that. Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, so it's not a local <laughs> one. Uh, what, what went wrong there? Uh, Actually, maybe let's back up. First, why Charlotte? Why are you flipping in Charlotte? My family's in Charlotte. Okay. And um, my brother, Terry, who you know, mm-hmm. Stud. I love Stud, Terry. dude. Just an awesome. He's a pastor at Elevation Church with Stephen Furtick. He's he's the second longest tenured pastor there. And um he's he's wired just like me. Like we're very similar. And, and he has has a passion for real estate and he understood it. And I, I was like, yeah, let's do this, you know. And I I wanted to bring him into it. Um, I think the challenge was the remoteness. And the fact that he's a 
full time pastor. Yeah. Like, you know, that's that's a lot yeah. to put on somebody. And so I have to own it. I didn't I didn't do well, like, you know, whoever doing remote, Don and Janelle, like they they figured out that system and and I so I was busy here and I didn't I, I didn't do a good job, you know. Yeah. How'd you find that one? That one was uh on the MLS. Okay. And um it would have it, it would have and could have been a great job. It's just taken two years. Yeah. Two so years. what? Yeah. So what's what's killing it? It's the rehab budget or the, no. the the holding costs. A lot of it was historical society. The um, HOAs were just impossible. Mm. It had a, a, a red tag violation from the county. So there was, you know, it wasn't all our situation. There yeah. was a lot of things that we couldn't control. So. Yeah. Is it an older home then? If it's it's a, is a, a condo, like a small condo uh, built in 1940. 1940, okay. Yeah. I think that's something that I see people do all the time is they'll buy uh, in a area and they don't know that there's an HOA in that area or they'll buy in a building that has an HOA. And what I see all the time is those HOAs, you have to have their approved contractors work on those properties, um, which then those guys charge two, three times what it yeah. costs to actually do it. Um, so HOA is terrible. I flipped a house one time uh, here in Hawaii and we painted it just the exact same color as a house, like two down the street or three down the street. And then the HOA came over like, nope, we have to approve your colors before you paint. We're like, well, it's the same exact same color as that. They're like, no, it's not. We're like, yeah, no, it is. is. No, it's not. They're going to make you repaint the whole thing. No. They made us repaint the whole thing. Just some other exactly the yeah, same color, just, basically, <laughs> different. but different. And I had to paint it twice. It was like seven grand each time. And I'm oh. like, like there was, it was just a pissing contest. Like it was just like these guys were like, you didn't ask our permission. No. So hmm. HOAs are the worst. They, they are. The worst. Just old, old people who have nothing better to do. Than oh, yeah. Especially yeah. in Hawaii. Our, our, our HOA, we had, yeah, it's no good. Yeah. <laughs> that's the best thing about Maui Meadows is no HOA. No HOA, man. Yeah. But that does make for weird houses and, uh, yeah, all the opportunities yeah. right yeah. there. There's tons of opportunity. Yeah. Dude, there is opportunity. Yeah, there's tons of opportunity. So, all right, man. What do you love about your wife? My wife is the most incredibly generous, like to a point where we, oh, uh, like, <laughs> like she is so thoughtful and caring of others. And, you know, that's something that's taught me. Um, she has an incredible voice. She's gorgeous. Um, like seriously, oh, I, I think I sent you one of the one of the songs. Um, yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. probably didn't listen yeah, to it. I did. It was good. Did you? Yeah, it sounded like Evanescence. <laughs> yes, that's right. You did say that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, I listen to it every night while I fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you guys been married? Tw- Coming up on twenty three years. It's amazing. What is the secret to a long lasting happy marriage, Bruce? A lot of grace, and mercy, and forgiveness. Like we've had art issues and i think faith you know a cord of three is not easily broken mm-hmm. you know and um yeah. yeah going back to what we were talking about at the beginning though when it's just not an option like yeah like you said it's not an option not unwavering, conviction. Conviction. unwavering unwavering conviction yeah like yeah that that changes everything because then when you get in a fight it's like well i can be miserable or we can figure this out yeah. and yeah. sit down and talk about it and sort through I it. think the time, as time goes on, your experiences, you know, you just, you, you begin to, I mean, compromise is a powerful word. Mm-hmm. So there is definitely compromise on, on both sides. And I don't, I can't pinpoint like what's the formula. Mm-hmm. It's just, just, just love. Yeah. You know, and, um, yeah, that's cool. Are you gonna continue flipping in uh, another state across the you know across the country, or is this done? I feel like I, I don't know. Mm. I I know that market now, so it's like, well, why waste that knowledge? Yeah. Um, however, I'm also trying to pivot to more commercial stuff, doing some self storage. That's um, right. I, I was going to ask you about that self storage. Yeah, it's uh, so we we have. A property identify we're in we're negotiating the purchase but it's it's ground up construction um and that's on the big island yeah okay i mean hands down yeah best at, at, you know asset class there is. <laughs> it's like i do love self storage yeah. so i mean that i mean i'm not gonna stop flipping it's like just 
create a system and 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 go on to bigger stuff, you know. So I don't I don't think so. I think there's enough opportunity here in Hawaii to to stay busy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How are you finding deals? Um, a lot of it's through relationships. Um, like I just got one in Kona, and it was just through a realtor that I bought a house five years ago. And she's, she didn't send it to anybody. She's like, hey, I got this property, uh, probate. You know, this is it. So I got the cheapest house in Kona through a relationship. I got it for 200, 283 Wow. Praising 750 Jeez. Um, I, I do a lot on auction, some on the MLS. And I'm starting to dabble in. I've never done any marketing. And, but I'm, I'm gearing up to start. Okay. Like, in, in that way, Hawaii is kind of lazy. Yeah. Like, you know, there's there's enough to go around, even just just the way I've been doing it. But I'm like, I, I probably could have fed the pipeline a little more if I had, you know. I don't know. You, mm-hmm. you tell me, Cam, because I'm, I'm new to this, but we're kind of building a campaign. And I did used to take calls with Doug, and so I understand that, you know, that's a big part of it. But yeah, I think direct-to-seller marketing is the – the best way to find deals. Um, obviously in my company, we do a lot of connector and, and relationships, which is something that you're incredible at is building relationships, but direct to seller marketing. I mean, you're finding deals before anybody else has found them. And what I love about direct to seller marketing, if you do it right. So there, there's two ways to do it. We've talked about this on podcasts before is you can be the person that is wanting to, to be the first person on that deal. Um, so you can get the, the cheapest you know price possible and take advantage of the seller. Um, in our company, we obviously don't look at it at all like that. We're wanting to be able to, to help the seller and, you know, and provide options for them. And sometimes that's most of the time that's not going with us where it's, Hey, this makes the most sense to list on the MLS, or this makes the most sense, um, to, you, you could paint it and clean it and make a lot more money versus us buying it from you and painting it, clean it. But we, we will give you an offer that's cash as is no contingencies um, and so I, I love it. I, this sounds like corny, but I love it because we get to truly like help people and change lives and, and coach people through really, really tough situations. And a lot of times they're embarrassing situations and that's why they haven't reached out to anybody is because they're embarrassed about the situation. And then when we come to them and say, Hey, we can help you through this. Like we, yeah. we get to be a part of, of that. So it's a, it's a blast when you are doing that. But, um, I do think in, in Hawaii, one of the things that, um, I have been kind of blown away by is there's just not a lot of people doing it. Yeah. And I don't know if that is it's hard. Me, well, and see, that's what I, 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 everybody I talk to is like, it's hard. It's hard. It doesn't work here. But I've literally, I've talked to maybe one person that's actually like done it and, and stuck to it over a, a long period of time. And so mm-hmm. I wonder if it's just, there's nobody that has actually like, like, you know, I, on the big Island, I, Maybe know one or two other flippers, mm-hmm. and are they sending out mailers? Or are they? I have no idea. I don't even know. Are they... it, it, there's a real scarcity mindset uh-huh. there. And so I started a, a meetup, uh-huh. um, which has been good. We're just trying to break that down. Um, yeah, it's weird. I don't. I don't. I don't understand it. Mm-hmm. And it's also kind of yeah. Well, good for me. Yeah. And I think here it is definitely a little bit different when you are talking with the seller and you, you're going to buy their house. It, it, most people aren't moving here, um, especially the distress seller, because they can't sell that house and go buy another one here typically. So if they're selling, yeah. they have to move off island. Um, yeah. And so it, it definitely, there's just a lot less movement in that yeah. side of things. So. I'm excited about what, mm-hmm. you know, being here and, and, and continuing to grow. I, and I, I've got some really strong partners now mm-hmm. that we're building a business with and we're going to do one here. Yeah. Um, flip? Yeah. Let's get them. You told me, so let's, let's flip one. I'm, I'm, <laughs> into flip, I'm into flip a house, man. I'm into flip a house. So as long as I don't have to do anything. <laughs> so, That's the best way to do You're it. fired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, let's shift uh, gears and head over to the next segment of the show. It's called the three, two, one pivot. So they have a pivot. You're going in one direction. Yeah. Something changes the direction of your life a little bit. So let's start with some books. Three pivot books, three books that have changed the direction of your life. I mean, the obvious one that we all say, um, Rich Dad really did impact me mm-hmm. to a major pivot. Yeah. Um, 
One book that I constantly go back to because it's something that I've had to really hone in and, and, and learn is never split the difference. Yeah. Like I'm constantly going back. I feel like I'm not doing a good enough job of really listening. I mean, the art of listening, when you're with somebody, like right now, I, get, I feel this with you guys. Like I'm the most important person to you and vice versa. Like obviously we're in a podcast, but in real life, that, those people are few and far between. Yeah. And I think that the, the, the stuff taught in that is like really listening, like your whole disc listening mm-hmm. and how you can profile someone in like their DISC. What's the, what's the acronym on the disc? Disc. disc. You, 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 you were telling me you're like, yeah, if, if I'm calling somebody and they're this person, I talk to them in this way. Yeah. I, you're I mean, mirroring. If, if you're a high D, like it, those are dominant, it's a dominant trait and I'm going to let them take charge and lead the conversation yeah. and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to play into their ego. If you're a high I, you're, you love people and you're outgoing and I'm going to play into that. I'm a high I, so that's easy to do. Or we're just yeah. going to, we're going to talk about the weather. We're going to talk about, you know, what's going on in the world and sports and and whatnot. And so, uh, so just profiling them and, and like, I think what, what I love about the disc is I always say is like the golden rule is, you know, you, you know, what's the golden rule? Love God and love others. Oh. He who has the gold makes the rules. <laughs> is it the golden rule? No, no. The golden rule. Well, what? Treat, well, treat, treat others the way you want to be treated. The way you want to be treated. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, I think there is a, there is a, there, what I would like to call the platinum rule. Okay. And, and that's Ooh. treat other people the way they want to be treated. And what I mean by that is like, I love every single night I could go hang out with people, have fun, play, play cards. Like that is, that is how I would want to be treated. Yeah. And so if my wife, she's not as out, she's incredibly outgoing, but not as outgoing as me. If I treated her that way and said every night, Hey, every night we're going to somebody's house, she would, she would hate me. Um, and so like, you have to treat other people the way that they want to be treated. Yeah. Um, and, and knowing, learning really quickly and being able to identify like yeah. this person wants to be treated this way. This person wants to be treated this way. That, that art is a lot. Hard. Like you, yeah. you said last week, you're like, oh, I tell my social media guys, like nobody cares about you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so bring value. But that is like, how do I, how do I really care? And it's through listening. And, and so, yeah, never split the difference. A th- the third book, and this these are these aren't like the typical books. They're just how the what they speak to me. So um, I think I mentioned this before, but Malcolm Gladwell's David and David versus Goliath. Yeah, yeah. Because I've always had this. I haven't read that. What's it about? <laughs> David and Goliath. Is it about David and Goliath? <laughs> no, 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 I wasn't saying that. Yeah, the, the, the <laughs> basic premise is. Yeah. Um, everyone says, oh, this is a Goliath story. You uh-huh. know, the, the underdog wins. And Malcolm Gladwell's take is David wasn't an underdog. Yep. He was an expert. Mm. And he knew, he's like, if I stay far, this guy is big and slow. I can outrun him for one. And I got my slingshot, which is, you know, basically like a gun. You know, mm. if you use it right, he's like, I'm, I, I'll take him down. Like he, he went into that thing confidently. Mm. So it flips that story on its head. And it talks about those type of stories. And there's one section that really spoke to me and it gave validation is because I'm, I'm dyslexic. Like I grew up super dyslexic and that was a real challenge for me. You know, growing up, my brother was the brainiac and I was like barely, I barely passed. And, you know, my mind is, is, and and creatives tend, whatever they tend Mm -hmm. to be, but like, it's just, it's just like this spaghetti soup. Mm. And so, in the Greek Western mindset way of teach, I wish I was like being taught now because they understand that back then it was like, this is how you learn. And it was really rigid and I didn't do well. And so somewhere in there, I believed the lie that I was just dumb. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that that limiting belief hurt me for so long, which is probably why it took me so long. And um, so it talks about like the, the majority or not the majority, a very high percentage of innovators, CEOs, um, AJ Osborne's and the, you know, like FedEx and Ikea, like they're all dyslexic. Really? And so he, he talks about, it's like, it's, it actually can be your superpower because okay. everyone's in this lane and you're out here. Well, and I mean, you see something like, oh, can we ship something overnight? Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's do that. Let's start FedEx. That's what I was saying earlier, where it's like you have been in the film industry, uh, you know, uh, had a band like 
and you've been a creative. And a lot of people would look at like transferring that over to real estate of like, I have no skills moving over into real estate. And like with talking with you, we've, we've gotten to hang out a ton and like see like the creativity that you have on your houses and how you're doing certain things and how you're, you know, zoning things and buying, you know, land to, to like, that is your superpower. And you've been able to transfer that over into real estate. And you've used what some people would look at as like a weakness where it's like, he has zero, you know, experience in real estate. And he was, he was a creative for the first 40 years of his life. And you've used that as a superpower to be able to, and eight years, build a massive real estate company of flipping properties and new development and storage. And so, yeah. So not your, probably your typical one, but I just, cool. I just, yeah. Spoke to me a lot and yeah. I like Gladwell a lot. He's an amazing writer. Yeah. Cool, man. Next right. question. So two people, two pivot people who are two people that have changed the direction of your life. Um, always, my mother has been at the pinnacle of mm -hmm. every major decision. And I think because she understood me and indecision has been a huge problem for me. And that stemmed from lack of confidence, of the dyslexia, of thinking you're stupid. So going back to the missions thing, she's like, you're going. Okay, mom. <laughs> and that pivoted me to, wow, I got a heart. She knew I had a heart yeah. for that. Why I am. Um, same with real estate. She was my first investor where I'm like, mom, what do I do? She's like, I'll be, I'll, I'll put the money in, mm -hmm. you know? So oh, yeah. she's cool. 82 doing awesome. That's awesome. Um, and to my, I can't even say it's real estate because there, there's, there's been a lot of people like you, like you've really, and you, you've really impacted my life. Thank you. Like, I have gone to a totally different level of mindset. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't break through those things. And so what you've created has just been remarkable. And it's really impacted me, obviously, so many. Um, but you're not my dad. I'm not. <laughs> and uh, my dad, I think, has shaped a lot of who I am. And, and he's, he's been, he passed 11 years ago this mm. week. And he taught me so much about faith and integrity. And, um, and I've, man, I have not lived up to, to what he has done, but he, he's shown me a foundation. My dad's story was a bit of a Job story in a sense, where towards the end of his life, he, had, he got cancer. He, his house burned down. He lost his job. He broke his hip. And um, he never once complained. Mm. And the cancer, um, for two years of his life, he couldn't eat. And I think a year he couldn't even drink water. And he never complained. And I remember him saying this. He's like, you know, you're asking your dad, and he's just stoic and strong and He's like, you know, the Lord's called me to fast until he takes me home. And that's what he did. He would literally pray for hours with this thing. Like he had a tube. That's how he stayed alive. Yeah. Um, so I think he taught me a lot. And, you know, it's also, there's a lot of conviction of not living up to, to, to that. But, uh, yeah, my mom and my dad. Pinch of, right. pinch of Brandon. <laughs> pinch of Cameron. Hey, I'll take it. It's great, man. All right, Bruce, Bruce. I'm going to just call you that forever, Bruce Bruce. Bruce, Bruce. Bruce. Uh, a pivot quote. A quote that's changed the direction of your life. Dang it, dude. I, a quote that's changed the direction yeah. of my life. Or guided your life or a quote you live by. Or a quote you okay, like. Okay, this, this goes back to my dad. Okay. He goes, well, I was 17 and he pulls me aside and he goes, David, there's one, ver the, the most, the, to me, this is the most important verse in the Bible. And, you know, what, what's your, what, what, do you, what would you say? John 3.16. Yeah, that's what everyone John, says. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I thought. Yeah. And he goes, no. I said, yeah, I said, I want you to memorize this verse, and I want you to meditate on it. First John 1 John 1.9. Mm. You know if what it we, is? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Yes. Yeah. And I, I remember, like, thinking at it. I was like, that's not the most important verse. It's like John 3.16 or whatever. Yeah. But in this context, he's like, okay, I know you're a person of faith. And I know you're going to have challenges and you're going to have problems. And 
just know that no matter what, how you screw up, which I've screwed up royally in my life, so many failures. LSD laced marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like no matter what you're going through, he is always there. He's never mad at you. He loves you and he's just right there. Yeah. Mm. Amazing, man. Love that. All right. Moving to the next part of our show, the past, present, future. We're gonna past, look present, at, future. Past, <laughs> oh, we do. We're going to start singing that. I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> you, oh, you're going to do the, what was your, your sing along that yeah. you hated or? Quick tip. Quick yeah. tip. Yeah. <laughs> past, present, future. So, um, so when you look at, at yourself when you were younger, um, let's go back to 20 year old Bruce Bruce. Yeah. Um, what, what advice would you give him today? Uh, what advice? Um, stop believing the lie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's the lie? That I was dumb, that I wasn't smart. And um, that actually shifted when I was 18 and I was sitting with my brother's friends and they were all, they say he went to CMC, which is a very hard, it was like one of the top schools and they're sitting around and I was just not doing any, I was like just out of, high school and everyone knew I was just floundering and this guy uh, Alton well I don't want to <laughs> nice uh, <laughs> sorry um, I'm gonna make sure to send this to him afterwards yeah. actually I just ran into him <laughs> a month ago and I told him the story and, and, and so anyway he, he walks around the room and he was he goes hey guys everybody in this room needs to become a CEO of a company because nobody's ever gonna hire David <laughs> oh and everyone's like, ah, 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 and I was, ah, but inside I was like, screw that guy. <laughs> and that night I went home and I, and I made the decision. I'm, I'm going to get a basketball scholarship. I'm going to make the honor roll. And it's going to be at a Christian college on the ocean. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And a year and a half later, I did that. Unwavering conviction. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm. I do have it. You do have it, man. It's there. But it's for me. It's like, why do you have to wait till your back is against the wall, till you're broke, till you're, someone's telling you're a loser? Yeah. I need to change that. Mm. All right, man. Present. Question about the present. What is currently, currently your number one rule for living a better life? That's convicting. But really, it's intimacy with God. Mm. Mm-hmm. What does that mean to you? Just understanding being present with your creator. Every good thing I've ever had is from God. And uh, so, I'm, yeah, really, it's, it's a convicting question mm-hmm. because that's really what we're called to is to, to walk with him. And so more of that cool. would be... Intimacy Love with it. God. Love it. And uh, future you, or actually future you being dead. So, so if you, yeah, if so. you know, I've been thinking a lot about death lately, which is not, no, I it's, it's kind of, it's kind of good, but it, because it really makes you wake up and be like, dude, I'm halfway done. Think. Yeah. It, it makes you think, um, and I, I, I love to go through this practice myself, but um, like at your funeral, what, what do you want? everybody to be saying about Bruce Bruce? I hope that they see somebody that was serving, loving, hopefully funny. Um, gosh. Um, and my, my, my kids, you know, they're the legacy. Um, which is a huge responsibility. I, I hope that, that they have generational wealth, mm-hmm. but I ain't going to hand it to them. Yeah. What, um, do, what do you want your kids to say about you? My dad loved me mm-hmm. unconditionally. And I, I, I believe that they feel that because mm-hmm. I, I tell them. And I, I, I am not. The, I'm, I'm a good father. Mm-hmm. I need to become a great father, and I, I don't know the answer to that. But. My kids know that I love them yeah. dearly. What do you love about each of your kids? Well, they're so unique. 
Caden is a spitting image of me, and he's we're actually very similar in in personality. Um, his drive and determination is insane. Like he just he like he was literally a, a prodigy drummer when we were in the band, and we he would get crowds at the airports. Like he would just pull out <laughs> drumsticks, or he would build kits, and he, he's had that conviction since he was two. And then it switched to trampolining, and he became one of sixty people in the world that could do this quadruple, whatever it's called, kaboom. And now it's it's working out. And now he's like, Dad, I want to do what you do. So I think his drive and conviction. My middle one is absolute angel, just salt of the earth, loves God, so mature. She's going to South Africa on a on a mission trip here in two weeks. Sorry, Brazil. She went to South Africa last year. And my youngest is so wild and creative. She loves horse, horses. I'm uh, actually, I'd be curious to get your advice on this. So she's, she's does started a YouTube channel on hobby horsing. <laughs> and she has one on horses and one on hobby horses. And, and in two months, she's gotten 1,500 subscribers. That's great. That's awesome. How old is she? 12. That's awesome. And she picks the music great, all the cuts and the edits and the lighting. And she's like, Dad, you didn't do that. Like whenever I do. What is hobby horses? You know, like, you got the horse stick in the head, you know, like Happy Gilmore. <laughs> what? <laughs> and they just run around with the, hobby, with the horse? It's actually a sport in Europe. Really? Like, you go through I've the— I've seen some videos on social media. I thought it was a joke. That's real, man. <laughs> <laughs> and as a, That's amazing. As a dad, you're like, oh boy. Oh, boy. Because, one, they're now in social media world yeah. and just the weirdness of— but I don't want to squash that. So I try to tell my kids, be a creator, not a consumer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and a hundred percent. Yeah. I would, I mean, not you, you're a lot farther along the father journey than I am, but I've just always believed strongly in the idea of like, just pour into the things that they love. Yeah. You know, and I, I see you doing that. Like they love, like she loves hobby horses, like pour into that, like let her, like, yeah. Yeah. Even like if the YouTube's a thing, like find a YouTube consultant to like, work with her to perfect it, you know, make it even better. I mean, that, like just hmm. pushing and spending the money, like mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be crazy, but just getting her in, like, yeah. if, if that's what she continues to want, just keep pouring into it. Yeah. Um, I wish, like my parents did a good job of that, but I wish they would have done more of that. Yeah. yeah. You know, like just like when they saw, like I was into, you know, whatever, building computers, like yeah. back when I was in high school, like I wish they would have been like, great, we got this guy over here who's going to help you build a really, really cool one. Yeah. And we're going to cover the cost of the, the materials if you build it. You know, like that would have just yeah. been like, Oh, like that's good. I yeah. need to take that to heart. One of one thing is you're saying that that I remember, and, and honestly, I I was I was blown away, and I thought it was so cool when um about this is probably about a year ago, and we ran into each other for the first time in a couple months, and you had lost a lot of weight, and we're like getting pretty muscular, and I and I asked you about that. I was like, dude, you look great, and um and you're you told me like your your way of working out for most of your life has been playing basketball and surfing. But your son had gotten into working out. Yeah, and you're like, and I just want to be able to hang out with my son and and do things that he wants to do. So I've got into working out, um, yeah. and I thought that was awesome. Where yeah. it's like, hey, so you're you're you are like one like changing up your passion just yeah. to be a part of your son's life, which yeah. I thought was super super cool. Dude, and the benefits are amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like I haven't worked out for 20 years, and I'm like, it's helping every area of my yeah. life. Yeah, you know? I agree, yeah. but. It reminds me of Mike Williams, my uh, investor relations guy. He's mm -hmm. VP of investor relations, but I uh, lived out here in Maui for a few years. Now he lives in Atlanta. But he has a, a thing he always says is, my family doesn't have individual hobbies. Mm -hmm. He's got young kids that are like, you know, 10, 11, 12. Uh, he's like, we don't have individual hobbies. We have family hobbies. Yeah. And so like, we all just do things that we mm -hmm. all do together. So for them, it's like rock climbing is their big thing because they all four can rock climb. And so they, they don't do individual sports like the girls on in tennis uh, or, or, you know, basketball, it's like they've group like family hobbies. And I love that idea. So I've been, mm. I've been thinking a lot about that as like, what's our family hobby? And not that the kid can't do something else, but just, yeah. we have a family hobby mm. that we do as a family and we all love. So encouragement to people listening to this is what's your family hobby. I love that. Yeah. All right, man. Love it. Moving man. on. End of the show. We're wrapping things up here. While he's looking this up, who's your favorite kid? <laughs> 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 what are you excited about? They're all my favorite. Yeah. What are you excited about? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for scaling, like pivoting in the commercial side. Yeah. I'm excited to get to, a, I feel like within a few years, I'll be like, 
in a position where I can more focus on the creative things. Yeah. That, you know, like there's a, not, a, I mean, there's creativity in real estate, but it's not what I was doing. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I feel like getting back to more creative space through the freedom of real estate. Yeah. Cool. Love it. And then where, where can people find you at? We're going to learn. Bruce Properties, you. not Bruce Bruce, at Bruce Properties <laughs> uh, on inst- Instagrams. And then the, uh, the F books is just David T. Bruce. Uh-huh. And I just started a TikTok. Did you really? Bruce Bruce. Please say your name to Bruce Bruce. <laughs> uh, you know what? I'll look at it. Yeah, I, I tried to do Bruce Properties and it was taken. So it's Hawaii. Shoot. Hawaii Properties. Hawaii. Hawaii. Hawaii Properties. Yeah. Hawaii okay. Properties. Appreciate you, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate you guys. We love you. I can't believe you let me on here. You can delete it if you want to. (laughs) (laughs) No, man. You're a rock star. Thank you. Three-way fist bump. Here we go. Boom. And that, my people, is the show. Thank you for tuning in. And hey, before you go, if you enjoyed the episode or if you enjoy the show in general, please consider leaving us a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. We really do value your feedback. And we read the comments. We make future decisions about topics and guests and everything else. Plus, it helps us reach more people and the more reviews we get. And last but not least, please head over to social media. Consider friending and following and subscribing to all that stuff at Better Life and my personal page at Beardy Brandon, Instagram, YouTube, and everywhere else. Thank you again for listening. I'm honored that you would bring me along on your journey toward building wealth through real estate investing without losing your soul. 